So I should probably say in the name of uh, full disclosure, I did wake up this morning early and got myself dressed, looked up on my closet, surveyed the options of baseball caps to wear this morning and <laughs> thought briefly about choosing that Red Sox cap, but thought, nah, I won't pour any salt in the wound this morning. So there it is, wore something more neutral this morning. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> this morning we are continuing our series from the book of Proverbs entitled Rediscovering the Wisdom of God. And our scripture passage today is from chapter 18, verse 21. Chapter 18, verse 21. I'm going to read it from a more modern translation, which is printed in your bulletin. This is from the message. But first, let's, uh, let's ask for the Lord's help. So again, Lord, thank you for your word. We're so grateful for it, for the way it uh, guides our lives and demonstrates your love for us and shows us the way that leads to life. So do what only you're capable of doing, and that is open our hearts wide open this morning so we can hear you speaking to us, Lord, by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Proverbs 18.21 reads, Words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Many of you probably recognize this text from the old King James Version. That's how I memorized it. Life and death is in the power of of the tongue. Proverbs 12, 18 also offers similar counsel, so I'm going to read that as well this morning. This is how it reads. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. <clears throat> okay, I'm not sure this proverb needs a lot of commentary. What I can do this morning, at least, is state the obvious here. And that is this piece of wisdom from God to us applies to all of us. All day, every day. With our words each day, we wield tremendous power, power to bring life or the power to bring destruction, the power to bring life to people or to crush them, the power to build people up with our words or the power to tear them down. Scripture says the power to poison them or the power to feed their souls every single day, all day, every day. In fact, let me give you an even a, a, a more modern version of this idea. Abby reminded me of a line from Dumbledore and Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows in our staff meeting on Wednesday, here it is. Words are, in my not so humble opinion, <laughs> our most inexhaustible source of magic, capable of both inflicting injury and remedying it. So here's our first lesson from this proverb. We are not wise people unless we grasp the power of words. Until we recognize that they can pierce like swords, that they can penetrate hearts and souls, that words have a deadly power, it says, to fracture the spirit. And the word used here in Hebrew is the one that describes 
a potter, a vessel of a potter that's broken by shattering. I think that's the image God wants us to have in our minds this morning about the power of our words. That when we say hurtful words to someone, they can cut them and wound them and leave a permanent scar. Think about how words spoken rashly or in anger can destroy a reputation, can destroy a relationship, can destroy a future, can destroy a family, can destroy a trust. Words can be like toxic chemicals that pollute the heart. I read an article recently that was a, an interesting study entitled, What Happens When Parents Are Rude in a Hospital? This researcher at a university in Tel Aviv did some research into simulated crisis scenarios in neonatal units of the ICU. And here's what they did. They set up these actors. And these actors posed as the parents of these tiny patients. And they gave a, a variety of feedback to the medical staff. For example, uh, one rude actor in the study played a mother who complained loudly enough so that the medical staff could hear, and this is what she said. She said, I knew we should have gone to a better hospital where they don't practice third world medicine. And the research demonstrated that even these type of, and I'll use their language, such mild unpleasantness was enough to negatively impact the performances of the doctors and the nurses. In fact, their ability to perform in these crisis situations was negatively affected for the rest of the day. The organizers of the study concluded that rudeness and unkind words explain more error than the levels of error that have been shown as a result of sleep deprivation. The power of words. We all know what it feels like to receive discouraging or critical words. Sucks the life out of us. Enervates us. It wounds us. That Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, stuns us with his teaching when he says that insulting or denigrating another human being who's created in the image of God, he likens to a form of murder. Because when we lash out with our tongues, he says that we can murder people's souls. So he knew how destructive words can be. Think about how many children have been told by their parents, you're stupid or you're ugly or you'll never amount to anything. And those words had the power to murder their futures. And many children never overcome the curses that poison their souls. I think about what Paul said in Ephesians 4.29, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. In fact, I was kind of intrigued by the fact that even in the Talmud, uh, the rabbis have similar teaching about gossip, where they too compare it to murder because it's irrevocable. Act um, similar to Abby's story, there's a rather famous Hasidic tale about a man who went through a town 
slandering the rabbi. And one day, I guess he felt rather remorseful. And so he went to the rabbi and begged for his forgiveness and said he was willing to do any form of penance. So the rabbi told him, take several feather pillows and cut them open and then just scatter them to the winds. So the man did it. When he returned, he told the rabbi and said, I fulfilled your request. And then the rabbi said, now the next step is now go out and gather the feathers. The man protested, that'd be impossible. The rabbi said, of course it is. And though you may sincerely regret the evil you have done and truly desired to correct it, he said, and I'll quote, it is as impossible to repair the damage done by your words as it will be to recover those feathers. The power of words. Words can destroy lives. Words can destroy reputations. Words can destroy communities. Words can either bring us together as community or they can divide us. And I think we can all agree this morning, regardless of our affiliations, our political leaders could use some godly, biblical wisdom of how they speak about one another and how they speak to one another. They may consider themselves important in the eyes of man, but they are being foolish according to scripture, in the eyes of God. As I thought about this topic, it reminded me some of the writing of a guy named uh, Rabbi Joseph Telushkin. I recommend anything he writes. He's an amazing source of wisdom, and he wrote a book called Words That Hurt, Words That Heal, and he's lectured a lot on this topic throughout our country on the powerful negative impact of words. And he often asks audiences this question, can you go 24 hours without saying any unkind or critical words about or to any other person? And invariably, he says, a small number of those in the audience will raise their hand and say yes. <laughs> but others, he says, tend to laugh uncomfortably and call out no. And he responds to this by saying, those who can't answer yes must recognize that you have a serious problem. If you can't go 24 hours without drinking, he says, you're addicted to alcohol. If you can't go 24 hours without smoking, you're addicted to nicotine. If you can't go 24 hours without saying unkind or critical words to others, then you have lost control over your tongue. And if you have lost control of your tongue, the Bible says you're a fool. So I hope this morning that we hear God's really loving instruction to us this morning to hold back critical words, to reject gossip, I think about how this is important that we show restraint on social media. But this scripture is about far more than just restraint. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to speak words of life. In fact, this is one of the ways in which we are created in the image of God. The Lord used words and spoke the world into existence. And as those created in his image, we have a similar power each day 
to speak words of life that can heal and bring hope and restore and transform. So each morning, we all wake up wielding tremendous power entrusted to us by God to change lives with our words. The soothing tongue, it said, is a tree of life. And a tree of life means that we should be places of vitality and life for people. That people want to be around us because we offer life. And this idea of a tree of life really suggests that life-giving speech helps restore what is broken within us through this healing speech and really carries us back to paradise, back to the Garden of Eden by giving life to those who hear our words. I've said this in the past in different contexts, but I believe it with all my heart. And that is, sometimes people say encouraging words to us that can then carry us through the rest of our day. How many of us have had that kind of experience? Someone says something encouraged, and we are just sort of flying the rest of our day. And sometimes people say words that are so encouraging to us that they carry us the rest of our week. <laughs> and sometimes people say things so encouraging to us that they carry us the rest of our month. And sometimes people say words to us that are so encouraging and so full of life that they carry us for the rest of our lives. When I was in the third grade, it's amazing to now to think back on how sports, youth sports has changed in our culture. Third grade, I was eight years old, was the first chance, the first opportunity to play any form of organized sports. It's amazing to think. I was eight years old, and at eight years old, I was playing t-ball. <laughs> and I was so excited. I can remember everything about it. That's a long time ago. 45 years ago, I still remember. I played for a team uh, called Minus Drugs. I was living in Oxford, Ohio. My father's doing graduate work at Miami. Minus Drugs. Purple and gold. I wore number eight for Carl Yastrzemski. <laughs> and one day, my coach, Mr. Gillespie, pulled me aside and said something so encouraging to me, so life-giving to me, it changed the whole trajectory of my life. It happened in about a span of maybe two minutes time. It changed my life. The power of words reminded me that within Judaism, they have these very interesting denominations or units of time. That's where I got the title for the sermon, three and a third seconds. That's actually a, a designated time unit for them. Chelek, it's called in Hebrew, three and a third seconds. So I asked my rabbi friend, what's significant about three and a third seconds? And he said, it only takes three and a third seconds to change a life by speaking words of life to someone. Wow. What power we wield all day, every day. Makes it exciting to get out of bed in the morning. 
Let me finish. Proverbs eleven seventeen says this. Your own soul is nourished when you're kind. But you destroy yourself when you're cruel. So here's the genius and the wisdom of God on full display for us this morning. That he not only gives us very specific, detailed, and explicit direction about how to live our lives that leads to healthy, fruitful, and fulfilling lives. And I thought, he's so loving. He's so kind to us, the way he guides us. He's such a good father. But he also designed us to flourish as human beings when we're kind to one another. But life will be lousy for us when we're cruel. <laughs> so we can continue to be masochistic <laughs> and be bitter and angry and cruel and unkind and it will literally drain the life out of our souls. Or we can be kind and nourish our own souls. Genius, right? He makes us to thrive by choosing life and by speaking words of life. And this whole teaching points us back to the cross where Jesus came to heal our wounded souls. It caused us to wound each other. To heal us so that we can now heal one another. He came to love us so we can now love one another. And we certainly have a chance in our culture to distinguish ourselves as followers of Jesus by the way in which we speak words of life. Last week, I mentioned at the beginning of the service how we lost two of our beloveds, Tammy Whittier, David Jordan Haas. On Friday and Saturday, there were two beautiful, powerful celebrations of their lives. Literally thousands of people came out to both the wake and the services. And I'll tell you what I heard in both services. The power of words in their lives. Morgan shared with us Tammy's commitment to always tell people that she loved them. To always say, no matter what they were going through, I love you. And we left that service. Morgan challenged us to go out today and follow Tammy's example and go say to somebody, I love you. The power of those three words to heal, to bring life, to restore. Then we heard at David's funeral the way he used words to encourage everywhere he went. And everyone he met, he offered words of life, words of encouragement, words of hope. Life and death in the power of the tongue. Let's follow their example. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. So, Lord, thank you for this tremendous gift and for the way you love us and try to guide us away from that which leads away from life and 
point us in the direction that brings healing and life and hope. And please, Lord, not only empower us to be those who bring life, but Lord, keep us, keep this teaching ever before us, Lord, that we might bear witness to your grace and goodness and love wherever we go. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.